Welcome, everybody, to the first National Soda Sum Summit. It's great to see people here from all over the country, from diverse organizations. And we're part of really what's become a new movement to promote health by reducing the consumption of soft drinks and move people towards healthier beverages. Uh, I'm delighted to take part in what I think is a historic conference and hooray for CSPI for pulling this off. This is going to be a conversation um, and um, also some highlights from our great speakers. Very, very excited to be here and uh, really hear and learn from all of you folks that have been doing work around the country to raise people's awareness about <clears throat> the health effects of sugary drinks and really think uh, strategically and creatively about how to reduce uh, Americans' consumption. I would say the success in, in Los Angeles County and California to a large degree has resulted from partnerships uh, outside health departments. We do have a, a new action plan uh, for obesity prevention for the city. Then in 2010, all sugar-sweetened beverages, as also Michael alluded to, were, were removed from our cafeterias, from our vending machines, as well as from any patient menus. But have, what have you done to really just increase access to free water so people wouldn't have to buy it? Public health is really about education. It's about public safety. It's about prevention. It's about intervention. And it's about sustainable green efforts as well. This also says something about the potential here because before 2002, smoking rates had been plateaued at 21% for about a decade. Uh, and then when my predecessor, Tom Frieden, came in with Mayor Bloomberg, decided to really take on tobacco, he demonstrated that it can be done. Smoking rates have fallen by 35% in New York City. That means 450,000 fewer smokers. It's been increasing among the young, the old, the rich, the poor, black, white, Hispanic. Um, and from a recent JAMA paper, we know that these trends are continuing. And it's, tar it's for young people to talk with each other from across the country of what's happening in their community, to share resources with each other. I also think that a uh, very strong Spanish language uh, component would be very important there because over 50% of the population there is, is Hispanic. It, it, it is a shame that um, relatives couldn't afford the diabetes medications. Right? They couldn't afford the, the treatment or access to healthcare in looking at how to advantage healthy foods in the price structure without necessarily relying on a tax that could have, where we don't really know how people are going to respond to it. Uh, any big company, whether it's soft drinks or not, will target a target consumer that is important to them from a profit standpoint. Now, so let's forget whether it's African American or Asian American or Hispanic American. If that, in, if that segment of the population drinks or eats more of my product for whatever reason, and I'm not going to deal with that for a second, then I will, I will target that segment and I will invest in that segment because the lifetime value of those individuals is enormous to me. Now, that's really troubling to me, but it's just a fact. And it's, it's, it's true in soft drinks, and it's true in virtually any you know, uh, marketing scenario. We public health folks are here, and we talk about our science, and what's, what's the level of evidence that we need before we act, and what, is, what do the marketers do? They figure out how to grab people's hearts. We have a great panel with multiple perspectives from basic science and clinical science all the way to economic science, public health science, and advocacy and policy. A trend toward increasing consumption of sugar-sweetened beverages that overlaps nicely with the prevalence change of obesity that doesn't prove causality, but it's notable. But it has to be, the science in my mind has to be the foundation for all of our work and policy. For example, there was a 20% uh, uh, tax that increased price by 20%. There would be about a 24% reduction in consumption. So the is, is why should I pay for somebody else's bad habit, right? That's, that's a real, I'm not overweight. Why should I pay? Why, are, why, why should I pay? That? And, and I think that one of the things that I like to try to talk about is that you're already paying. Inaction is irresponsible. It is wrong, and those of us who have an opportunity to turn that around need to be held accountable. 
and really only in the last 50 years that caloric beverages represented in the history of humankind anything more than 10, 20, 30 calories a day. So we've really changed. No one thought this was, these were serious issues and I had to convince people that they were and I was working totally alone. So when I met Mike and George, they were my first colleagues and it was so exciting to meet people who were as crazy as I was and looking at these issues in this particular way. What are approaches to address the sugar-sweetened beverage problem in a community and what's working, what's tough, what's hard, what's easy? And when I think about voluntary actions of the soda industry, I think about what if we had actually just relied on voluntary action by the tobacco industry. We've been throwing pebbles in the river of tobacco control and now except lately in California, but pretty much around the country, we can just walk right across. Doesn't mean it doesn't take work, but we can walk right across. Now, let me just close the conference, thank everybody again, take your lunch, have a good year, and maybe we'll come together in another year and see what kind of progress we've made. Thank you. Thank you.